Oui. On attend. On December 15, 1995, crowds gathered and cameras clicked as 30-year-old Belgian professional footballer Jean-Marc Bosman appeared. Was he being unveiled by a new club or being greeted by fans prior to an important match? No, he was not. Instead, the Belgian footballer was entering a courtroom in Luxembourg moments before the European Court of Justice was set to rule on his case, a case which I should note had begun five years earlier and had the potential to drastically impact all of professional soccer in Europe. And when president of the court, Gil Carlos Rodriguez Iglesias, delivered that decision... ...professionnel de football, ressortissant d'un état membre, à l'expiration du contrat qui le lie à un club... That's pretty much what happened. On this episode, we're going to be looking at what a Bosman transfer is, how it's different from a more standard player transfer, and the background that led to the historic court decision. But before we get to that, let's play some music. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another special solo episode of Soccer 101. I am Taylor Rockwell, and today we're going to be going deep on free transfers, also known as Bosman transfers. It's somehow a tale that motivates us to challenge authority, reminds us of the ramifications of doing just that, and serves as a cautionary tale of how one man's battle is another man's Pandora's box, uh, especially if that Pandora's box leads to a bunch of people making a bunch of money. Uh, But first, a quick bit of background about transfers. If you're new to the sport, in America we have trades, you swap one player for another, it all works that way. Uh, But in the rest of the world, they do have trades, but more often than not, players tend to move via transfers. So let's say Manchester City want to buy a player from Borussia Dortmund. The first thing they need to do, Man City need to do, is artificially inflate their sponsorship numbers so they can skirt financial fair play rules in order to be able to afford that Dortmund player. But that may be a bit of a bad example. It's kind of specific to Man City. Let's say generally, let's say Arsenal want to buy a player with, say, three years remaining on his contract at Borussia Dortmund. Uh, The basic process is that they would contact Dortmund, agree to a fee up front that they would have to pay if the player agrees to terms with Arsenal. So Arsenal called Dortmund, say, hey, we want that player. Dortmund say, all right, it's going to cost you 40 million pounds. Arsenal agree to that. Then they can talk to the player. If they agree to terms with the player, then they pay the fee. The player moves. Everybody's happy, or at least hopefully they are. That's ideally how it's supposed to work uh, when the player is still under contract. Uh, But what happens when the player is out of contract or his deal with his current club expires? Then that player Uh, He or she is free to sign with whomever he or she wants to because they're effectively a free agent. With no contract tying them to a specific club, the player can go out and sign for whomever fits the bill, or perhaps more accurately, pays the bill. However, this was not always the case. In fact, prior to the landmark ruling in 1995, free transfers did not exist. Even if a player's contract had expired, his or her former club still held their rights and could block player movement without much justification. That all changed with Jean-Marc Bosman. Uh, Born in Belgium in 1964, Bosman was a promising footballer from an early age, making more than 20 appearances for the Belgium U21 national team. The midfielder first appeared for Standard Liège in 1983, we'll call them Standard, before switching to RFC de Liège, we'll call them Liège, in 1988. He did that on a two-year deal. That moved basically proved to be a mistake. Uh, Bosman only made three appearances in the two seasons, did not have a good time, did not enjoy his time with Liège, wanted to seek out greener pastures when his contract expired. Uh, The then 25-year-old landed on a trip across the border to French club Dunkirk. He felt like that would be the place to go to sort of reignite his career, get things back on track, and because he's out of contract, why not? Uh, Liège, who had spent £66,000 to sign the midfielder only two years earlier, wanted to make sure they got a return on their investment. They didn't want him just going off and them making no money. Dunkirk benefit from their hard work, or the three appearances, I guess, is what he made, so maybe that's how they're benefiting. But essentially, Liège slapped a price tag of £500,000 on the player and insisted his potential new club pay the entirety of that fee up front. Uh, in modern transfers and back then, uh, maybe you agree to £40 million, but it's £20 million up front, £20 million later. Here, uh, Liège wanted all £500,000. And again, we're talking about 1990. At that time, uh, the world World record transfer fee was eight million pounds for Roberto Baggio. So world record transfer, eight million pounds, underperforming Bosman, 500,000 pounds. You can see it was an exorbitant sum. But Liège didn't even stop there because though Bosman's contract had expired, as we established, the situation at the time meant that Liège still owned his rights and therefore still had to pay him. So he couldn't move without their approval, but they did still have to provide for him. That's good. However, since the new salary wasn't governed by the old contract or any 
any sort of new agreement, they could cut his wages, which they did. Liège slashed his wages by 75% to 500 pounds a month. So to sum it up, instead of letting him move to a new club and getting on with his career, they're charging an exorbitant fee and also not paying him very much money. But before we get to Bosman's response to Liège's salary slash, I'd first like to thank today's sponsor, ExpressVPN, for helping make this episode possible. ExpressVPN is the best virtual private network on the market, and I say that with some confidence because I tried others, and their slow speeds or connection issues had me nearly smashing my computer. I've got some rage issues, but you know, I think the VPN didn't help with that. ExpressVPN is fast and therefore won't slow down your computer's performance or make things get all laggy. It's easy to use and therefore doesn't require any programming or anything like that. And best of all, it does not log your data and therefore doesn't betray you to the internet underworld or make money by selling your information to ad companies. That is very nice of them. Uh, It really is amazing that you can connect to servers on the other side of the world uh, and still stream, say, pixels on Dutch Netflix without only seeing a bunch of individual pixels. Uh, Just kidding about watching pixels. Don't watch pixels. You don't need to do that, but not about the connection speeds because they are guaranteed and they will work and you will be able to access whatever you want via the beauty of your VPN. So protect yourself with the VPN that we use and trust. You can use our link at expressvpn.com slash soccer and get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash soccer. Visit expressvpn.com slash soccer to learn more. So thank you very much to our friends at ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode of Soccer 101. Now let's get back to our other friend, Jean-Marc. Uh, basically, when last we left him, he felt he should have been permitted to move given the lack of contract, but his options for appeal were pretty limited. So desperate to move clubs, feeling he'd been blacklisted by his club, Bosman turned to lawyer Jean-Louis Dupont. Uh, as the Telegraph later reported, quote, At the outset, Dupont reckoned the whole thing would be sorted out in a couple weeks. But wherever they turned, they met with stony looks and slammed doors. As weeks turned into months and months turned into years, multiple attempts at a settlement fell on deaf ears. The authorities refused to take us seriously, DuPont would later say. So as they said, weeks turned into months, months turned into years, and eventually the case made it all the way to the European Court of Justice. Bosman's legal team argued that the rules on player freedom as they currently stood violated uh, EU provisions on freedom of movement for workers as well as freedom of association. More than two years after the initial court filings had begun, the Court of Justice ruled in Bosman's favor. The judges found that the present system, which had prevented Bosman's move to Dunkirk, placed a restriction on the free movement of workers that had been agreed upon at the Treaty of Rome way back in 1957. Okay, so this is where my nerd brain wants to go super deep and look at the Treaty of 57 and figure out what kind of player movement and worker rights were being violated, but I feel like that would add an additional 20 minutes onto this episode. I'd probably lose you along the way. Daryl would roll his eyes. Nobody wants that. So basically, instead of going deep on European governing practices and procedures, the gist of it is that the court found Liege had violated Bosman's freedom of movement when it stopped him changing clubs after his contract was no longer valid. So if Effectively, the Court of Justice banned restrictions on foreign European Union players within national leagues and allowed players in the EU to move to another club at the end of a contract without a transfer fee having to be paid or, as we say nowadays, on a free. Uh, So two big things there. Number one, now if your contract is expired, you can move wherever you want. There doesn't have to be a fee. Your team can't hold you up. But also, there can't be the restrictions in place on foreign quotas and number of foreign players that are allowed in your league, uh, at least not in the way that they had been before. So basically, we've got a monumental shift here, the ramifications of which really became clear almost immediately. Uh, As Sir Alex Ferguson would later say about this moment, uh, once the European Court of Justice ruled that clubs no longer had to pay transfer fees after the expiration of a player's contract, all hell broke loose. Suddenly, it was a free-for-all. And the system had pretty much always been, if you want to sign a player, you have to pay his club first, then they'll decide a fee. Now it was, you can still do that, or you can wait until this contract expires, make sure to offer him more than everybody else, and he is yours. And this is where I would like to talk about the difference between transfer fees and salaries, because we have seen that massive jump in transfer fees. As I said earlier, I think the record in 1990 was around £8 million. Uh, pounds. Today, the record remains Neymar's move from Barcelona to PSG. That tops the list at £198 million. Pounds. So from £8 million in 1990 to almost £200 million in 2017, I think it was. 
was, uh, that's a pretty drastic jump right there. But the player salary jump is equally impressive and equally revealing. In 1994, a year before the Bosma decision, Blackburn Rovers made Chris Sutton the first 10,000 pound a week footballer in Britain. Writing for the Telegraph, Jonathan Liu summed up the situation pretty well. By 2001, Sol Campbell could command 100,000 pounds a week to move from Tottenham to Arsenal, a tenfold increase in the span of just seven years. It is hard to imagine any profession in any industry in the world that got richer quicker because that's what happens. Now you don't have those limitations in place. Players can move wherever they want. So basically, if you're a club who wants that player, you've got to be willing to pay them more. With reduced limitations on player movement and foreign player quotas, there's also greater movement than ever before, which means there's probably going to be a financial impact that we haven't seen before. In this case, it would be, say, the rise of modern super agents like George Mendez and Mino Raiola. Uh, It really does connect fairly directly to a Bosman ruling. If you're a young player, you're looking to explore your options, who better than an agent who's been there, who's done all of this to help you kind of navigate these new waters. Uh, Increasing wage demands from the players also changed the way clubs were owned and operated uh, as the small-time owners were effectively priced out by billionaires who could afford to pay medium talents, say, 5.2 million pounds a year. Uh, No no one in particular, but let's just say Danny Drinkwater as an example. Uh, With more money on offer all over Europe, players move with much greater frequency than they had in the past, all while old-school managers and fans complained about a lack of loyalty. Instead, we have players like Andrea Pirlo, Steve McManaman, Robert Lewandowski, Henrik Larsson, Michael Ballack, and the aforementioned Sol Campbell, all utilizing free transfers to move to seemingly greener pastures. Uh, And so you have this massive explosion in what players are making. There's much more player movement. There's much more player freedom. And that is a positive. Certainly, it's a positive that you don't have these restrictions so players can move. They're not sort of bound to these clubs who no longer have their best intentions at heart. But it also does create this whole subculture, especially when you look at agents and you look at the billionaire gazillionaires who have taken over clubs, you've got to be able to afford those salaries. This is kind of how you make it happen. For Jean-Marc Bosman, the ruling did not do a lot to alleviate his problems. The move to Dunkirk had long since broken down. Much of the money that came from FIFA Pro and the courts went straight to legal fees. I think he ended up having to sell uh, his second home, uh, his car, some other things to make ends meet. Graham Ruffin, who's appeared on the Total Soccer Show several times, uh, our buddy Graham, interviewed Bosman for Vice News in December 2015, 20 years after the court ruling. Here is an excerpt from that article. Uh, Quote, Bosman's professional playing career affected effectively ended with the ruling that freed so many others, and he last turned out for a team on the tiny French island of Réunion in the Indian Ocean. Uh, His fight against FIFA and UEFA was followed by a fight against depression and alcoholism and a custody battle for his children. Said Bosman, there are some players who earn 200,000 euros to 300,000 euros a week, and that is thanks to me. I freed football. In the UK, it is football is beautiful, thanks Bosman. Everywhere in the world, it is thanks Bosman. But Bosman doesn't earn 300,000 euros a week. Until now, Bosman earns zero euros per month. That's the difference, end quote. Humility aside, Bosman is correct that his stand in the 1990s has paved the way for the structure of soccer that modern players enjoy. Uh, Many of these guys who are making many, 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 many millions of dollars a year and many hundreds of thousand pounds or euros a week would not be able to earn that amount of money were it not for Bosman and the kind of five-year crusade he had to eventually force the court to reach this decision, which freed all of soccer, if you want to take Bosman's perspective. So, if you happen to see, say, Neymar on the streets, a very likely occurrence, uh, maybe ask him to Venmo a few euros to Bosman because he definitely deserves it. Well, that about wraps up this episode of Soccer 101. Hopefully, you now know what a Bosman transfer is and how it came to be. If you don't, maybe try listening again. We'll see what happens. Uh, That should definitely provide a solution. But for now, thank you very much uh, to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode and to you listeners out there who have taken the time to listen. I've been Taylor Rockwell. This has been Soccer 101. 